Thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, thank you to the club for the invitation to join you here today. I'm planning to spend uh, most of my time today talking about the objectives of monetary policy. As you will hear, the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, uh, the monetary policy making arm of the Federal Reserve, has made great progress in formulating and communicating the objectives of monetary policy to the public. I'll discuss some of that progress, and then I'll move on to some ideas about how the committee can make further progress, further improvements in its communications about its objectives. And I look forward to your questions as well at the end of my speech. Uh, I always learn a lot from the question and answer sessions. Before I start, though, I, I must remind you that the views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of, of others in the Federal Reserve System, and in particular, not necessarily those of uh, others who serve with me on the Federal Open Market Committee. So to start off, I thought I'd start off with some basics about the Federal Reserve System. I like to say that the Fed is a uniquely American institution. Well, what do I mean when I say that? Well, if you look around the world, you look at other central banks around the world, the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve System, is highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., makes up the system. Our bank represent, is the headquarters of the operations of the Federal Reserve System in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. Our district is enormous geographically. It includes the state of Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, they gave us all the warm places in the U.S. That's, that's the way they, they allocated it out. Um, so eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee uh, the FOMC meets to make monetary policy. So th these meetings take place in Washington, but the attendees include all 12 presidents of the various regional feds, uh, including me, and the um, uh, members of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System who, who sit all the time in Washington. Now, the committee itself, that is the, the people who actually vote on monetary policy, changes from year to year. The governors always vote, and the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York always votes. Um, but the, uh, the, the other four uh, voting members, the other four uh, uh, voting uh, members are, are a group of four presidents that rotates from year to year. Right now, this year in 2014, I'm one of those voting members. But in 2015, I will not be anymore. So in this way, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the federalist structure of our government uh, because representatives from different regions of the country, the various presidents, uh, have input into FOMC deliberations. Now this basic federalist structure has a long history. In fact, this year, this week, I should say, is the centennial of the opening of the 12 uh, Federal Reserve Banks and the start of the work undertaken by the Federal Reserve System. I'm gonna forget the exact date, but it was this week in November of 2014, uh, 1914 when the Reserve Banks opened. Now, it's been a fascinating 100 years uh, lots of twists and turns along the way, and I'm sure that many of you have questions about, about that history. Uh, I'm sure people in this room have a question about why Minneapolis, um, as opposed to, you know, anyways. Um, but but uh, the answers to many of your questions, um, and, and, I, I, and probably many more that you haven't thought of, are on a website that the Fed has created to mark our centennial. And that uh, uh, website, which will continue to exist after the, uh, after the centennial is over, is Federal Reserve History, all one word, dot org. And I encourage you all to visit that site to learn more about the people, the places, and the events that have helped shape Federal Reserve History. Now, I won't say too much more about uh, Fed history, but I do want to draw your attention to one of the things that I think has changed the most about, about the Fed in the last hundred years. And that's our communication with the public. Now, as I I've described, 100 years ago, Congress deliberately created a system that was designed specifically so that residents of Main Street would have a, a voice in monetary policy. Now, technology has changed a lot since 1914. And so the ways that we gather information from the public have also changed. But this fact-finding is still an important part of the making monetary policy. As I travel around the 9th District, um, we, I often meet with business leaders and other citizens 
in, the, in local communities to gather exactly this kind of information. So recently, for example, um, we uh, um, went up to Virginia, Minnesota, had a meeting with an advisory council come, who come from outstate Minnesota and from uh, northwestern Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to gather local economic intelligence affecting their, their communities. Now, communication is a two-way street, however, and I'm just describing how the Fed gathers information from local citizens, but during the past century, the Federal Reserve's communications to the public about its monetary policy actions have evolved greatly. The, this pace of change, I think, was especially rapid in the eight years under Chairman Bernanke's leadership. So as you may recall, Ben Bernanke was chair, chairman of the Federal Reserve System uh, from January 2006 through January 2014. So he just stepped down at the beginning of this year. Um, and under his leadership, really the, uh, very, a lot of evolution in the way the Fed was communicating to the public about its monetary policy actions. As the Fed plans for its second century, I would say that the importance of two-way communication is a key lesson from the first century of our existence. And in the order for the Fed to continue to be effective, it needs to continue to communicate its policy decisions transparently to the public. And conversely, it does need the public's input on how those policies are affecting them. And events like the ones today, where I'm, I'm giving uh, remarks and thoughts about uh, monetary policy to you, but then I get to hear from your questions in, in, as well, uh, that's, I think, exactly the kind of two-way communication that I have in mind. Now, with that background in mind, uh, let me turn back to the FOMC and the, the making of monetary policy. I mentioned the FOMC meets eight times per year. At these meetings, what we do is we decide on the level of monetary stimulus for the economy. Now, I'm not going to get into too many details of what that term monetary stimulus means, although I'm you know, more than happy to take questions about it afterwards. What I want to emphasize only, is only one thing. When we change the level of monetary stimulus, we, t we move employment and inflation in the same direction. Inflation, by inflation, I'm referring to the rate of growth of prices of goods and services in the economy. When we raise stimulus, we push up on inflation and up on employment. When we lower stimulus, we tend to lower uh, inflation and lower uh, employment. So the basic point is that we don't have a tool that pushes in opposite directions on inflation and employment. That's going to be important to keep in mind as I, I talk about our our, uh, uh, our performance over the last seven years. Now, I'm going to turn now, though, to, to my, the main theme, my, the remainder of my speech, which is the goals that the FOMC seeks to achieve by varying the level of monetary stimulus. Now, when I talk about the goals of the Federal Reserve and the FOMC, the natural starting point for that conversation is the Federal Reserve Act. Now, I'm often asked who owns the, the Federal Reserve and the answer is the Federal Reserve is owned by the American people because we're a creation of the Congress of the United States. And the way that uh, we were set up is through the Federal Reserve Act. Now, the, through the Federal Reserve Act, Congress requires the Federal Reserve to make monetary policy so as to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Now, most economists believe that if the Fed achieves the first two mandates, the first two goals I mentioned, maximum employment and stable prices, it'll automatically achieve moderate long-term interest rates. So usually, uh, monetary policymakers in the United States are described as having a dual mandate. That is to promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. And so this short overarching description of Federal Reserve objectives, it comes from Congress, promote price stability, to promote maximum employment, is the foundation for current monetary policy making. But it's short, you know, it's short, so it's short on specifics. So in January 2012, in a key milestone uh, in the evolution of the Fed's communications to the public, the FOMC ad ad adopted a longer and more precise description of its long-run goals. And I'll talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this document it's relatively short, it's about a page long, five paragraphs. Um, it's, uh, it's, and I think it's important really for all Americans to read this document because it's, it's, it's relatively clear by, by the standards of central bankers, it's very clear. And, um, and, and uh, you know, monetary policy is something that affects everybody. So it's really, really critical, I think, for everyone to understand, to know what the Fed is trying to do when it's making monetary policy. 
I'll be talking about this document. When I talk about it, I'm going to refer to it as the framework statement. It's got a lot of important points it touches on, but I'm going to only mention three main elements today. The first main element I'm going to mention is that it takes the words price stability that comes from Congress and translates it into a number. And that number is 2%. So that, those words price stability means that the, the Fed is targeting a 2% annual inflation rate over the longer run. And that term inflation rate specifically refers to the rate of, uh, the, uh, uh, to, to the personal consumption expenditure, PCE inflation rate. Now this is a little different from the consumer price index that you usually uh, hear referred to in the, in, the, 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 in typical, later this week for example, it will be released. That's the one that gets most of the press attention. The Fed has done a lot of studies on this and decided that the, the PCE inflation rate does a better job of capturing um, an inflation that faces the, the, the households in the United States. The main thing you want to take away, I think, from when I talk about the PCE inflation rate is that it is a measure of inflation that includes all goods and services, including those related to food and energy. So sometimes you'll hear talk, people talk about core inflation that takes out uh, goods and services, the prices of goods and services related to food and energy goods. And I'll mention, I'll later on I'll tell you why they do that. But when we target 2%, we're talking about all goods and services. And, you know, I think this 2% target is a very important piece of communication. It means that the American public need no longer guess, either on the upside or the downside, about where the, uh, the Fed is trying to take inflation. The answer is 2%. So that's on the price stability front. On the max employment front, the framework statement um, explains why the Fed can't provide a, a similar numerical uh, objective. It quite rightly emphasizes that monetary policy is not a prime determinant of max employment, even over the longer run. Um, so that means that our policy stance has to be based on a ever-evolving ever evolution, ever-evolving assessment, I should say, of the maximum level of employment in both the medium and long run. So my own assessment of the long-run unemployment rate consistent with 2% inflation is currently 5%. And that assessment, though, has fallen a lot over the past uh, 18 months or two years. So the, finally, so those are the two, two points. One is price stability means 2% inflation, and the second point is max employment. We're not, the, the committee can't provide a number, uh, that, that uh, unchanging number to, 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 to in the same fashion for that. The final point I want to make about the framework statement is that it describes how the committee weighs the two mandates against each other, promoting max employment and promoting price stability. Uh, many times in public conversations about monetary policy, these mandates are described as if they're um, uh, in tension with one another. And the, I think the framework statement does a, very, it does a very important thing by emphasizing that typically these two mandates are complementary to one another. So I noted earlier that monetary policy pushes inflation and employment in the same direction, but most shocks that hit the economy also tend to push employment and prices in the same direction. So an adverse shock will typically push both employment and prices downward so if monetary policy tries to raise employment back up, it's also going to be doing inf raising inflation back up towards target. Now this is not some uh, in, in purely economic theoretical point of some kind. The past few years provide a clear example of this kind of complementarity of the two mandates. This is a picture that goes back to the early 80s. And the gray shaded areas are showing you the recession periods. So if you go to the far right of the picture, um, that is the, uh, the, the latest recession we went through, the Great Recession. And it goes from the end of 2007 through the middle of 2009. And the unemployment rate rose from under 5% at the, end of, at the beginning of 2007 to 10% oh, to in October 2009. It's come down gradually. And so we're now at 5.8% as of um, October. So that's a very gradual improvement in the labor market, still above, as I said, where I uh, see the labor market going over the longer run. But I think there are a lot of ways in which you would, might think that th you, could, you could say that this improvement in the labor, on the unemployment rate is actually an exaggeration of the improvement in the labor market as a whole. The way the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures the unemployment rate is by asking households 
Um, you have a job in the, do you have a job? And then you'll be counted as employed. Then if you don't have a job, have you looked for one in the past four weeks? So, and the unemployment rate is the fraction of those people who have looked for a job in the past four weeks to the sum of these two groups, the employed and the unemployed. Now, there's two reasons then why the unemployment rate can be coming down. One is because more people are finding jobs, and the other is because um, the, uh, the, the fewer people are, fewer people are saying they've looked for a job in the past four weeks. And a lot of the improvement that we've seen in the unemployment rate is actually for this latter reason that um, fewer people are, are looking for work. This is just the fraction of people in the population over the age of 16 who have a job. Now you see something similar to what happened, if you go again to the far right, look at that gray shaded area, you see that the employment population ratio was over 63% uh, in the beginning of 2007, fell sharply in the, um, in the, uh, during, the, during the recession, and has shown much less recovery than the unemployment rate itself. It's now, it was in the low 58s, it's now up to uh, over 59%. This is actually um, it, it's still, I would say, you don't see much improvement. The past year, we've seen actually much more uh, improvement than we had seen in the previous, um, uh, previous four years, so that, that, that's gratifying. But that 59.2% remains very low to compare to that 63%, which we had seen earlier. And it, it, in this graph, you just don't see that same level of the kind of improvement we saw in the unemployment rate. Now, we have to be careful with this because one reason this number can become, is going to be suppressed, it's kept down, is because uh, of the baby boom uh, cohort. So a large group of people, as, you, as I'm sure you all know, was born, a relatively large group of people were born between the years 1946 and 64 in the United States. Those people are getting into retirement age, and we'd expect then this number to just be falling simply because of more and more people being in that retirement age group. So this is 20, employment population ratio of 25 to 54. And um, so this is, again, you see that large fall in the recession period. And, but now we see, you do see, and I think it's important to stress this, you see more recovery in this number than we had seen in the employment population ratio for the whole, whole population over the age of 16. And that rep represents the fact of this demographic effect that I, I've noted earlier, that more and more people are re reaching retirement age. But nonetheless, we were over 80% in early 2007 in this number. We, we fell into the, um, I think, below 75% at one point. We've come back now to almost 77%, but still uh, uh, noticeably below where we were. I, we see more recovery in this number than in the 16 plus employment population ratio. But again, I, I don't see as much improvement here in this metric as I did in the uh, uh, unemployment rate itself. So overall, I think the, the way I would describe this is that the performance, the, 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 that labor markets have been distressingly weak in the United States since 2007. So if, if you look at inflation, what's been going on there? Well, this graph is, shows you the PC inflation since uh, December 2007. And since that time, it's averaged 1.5%. Um, that's below our target, which I earlier described as being 2%. You see a lot of, this is a very variable uh, series. And, and in particular, you might note that if you go to 2008, it got as high as 4%. That's because it's got the energy goods and services in it. The price of oil, when it moves around, will move those energy goods and services a lot. And we, that's why people strip out energy goods and food uh, goods and services out of inflation sometimes, is because they want a better metric of where inflation is going to go in the future. Look at the middle of 2008 when inflation was 4%. If you had said to yourself, boy, inflation is 4%, I think it's going to keep on being very high, well, you would have been pretty wrong. You look at it collapse. And that's because oil is, you know, it's not, it, it moves around a lot and it's not very persistent. It's very transitory, the price of oil and its movements. So you don't want, you, that's why people take out that that was the energy, the food and energy goods and services sometimes are focused on core inflation because it's going to be a better market of where we're going to go in the future, not where we are today. Now, this is, but this is including all goods and services, including those related to food and energy. And now we're running at 1.4% inflation. If I had stripped out those food and energy goods and services, it would be, we'd be at 1.5%. So we're below target. And I'm, I'm a, a continuously expected to, to, to uh, remain below target. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more in, uh, in a few minutes.
My point right now is simply for you to take away, we had a big shock in 2007, great recession, and it drove both prices and employment in the same direction, down. And the, what the, the conclusion to reach is that this was, the mandates were complementary to each other. Unfortunately, monetary policy was insufficiently accommodative to push both prices and employment back up to target in a, and to desirable levels in a, in a short period of time. Okay, so I wanted to talk about possible improvements in the FOMC's framework statement. And so I'll talk about two, two, two possible clarifications in particular. One is I think that the FOMC should clarify that its inflation objective is symmetric. Um, many observers emphasize the need to keep inflation from rising above 2%, but in my view, inflation below 2% is just as much of a problem as inflation above 2%. The Central Bank of Canada, for example, also has a 2% objective, but it's lang it has very clear language about symmetry that um, the bank is equally, that is the Bank of Canada, is equally concerned about inflation rising above or far falling below the target and will act in order to bring inflation down or push it back up to 2%. In my view, the FOMC should have similar language. Now, why do I see symmetry as being important? Without symmetry, inflation might spend considerably more time below 2% than above 2%. And that could create doubts in households' minds or in firms' minds but whether or not the FOMC is targeting 2% or something lower than 2%. And that unmooring of inflation expectations would mean monetary policy be less effective at um, being able to combat adverse shocks. So that's one change, symmetry. The second a clarification is I think the FOMC should consider articulating a benchmark two-year time horizon for returning inflation to the 2% goal. Uh, right now, although the, inflation, the FOMC has a 2% inflation objective over the long run, it's not specified any time frame for achieving that objective. This lack of specificity suggests that appropriate monetary policy might engender inflation as far from 2% for years at a time, and that creates uncertainty about inflation and employment. Relatedly, not having a time horizon, I think, can lead to a lack of urgency in trying to achieve that goal. I think if the FOMC were to publicly articulate a two-year benchmark horizon, that would lead to more alacrity in trying to, trying to, to, trying to pursue, that, uh, pursue that inflation objective. This is an impractical su suggestion. Many central banks have exactly this kind of time horizon. Again, to go to our neighbors toward the north, the Bank of Canada has exactly a, a, a benchmark two-year time horizon. It doesn't mean they always aim to get inflation back to target within two years. But it does mean when they're not doing it, they have to provide a, a clear explanation of why they're taking longer or shorter to get inflation back to target. Now, so I've, I've, I've suggested two changes, clarifications, I would call them, in the framework statement, symmetry of the inflation target and um, a, uh, a, a two-year time horizon, a, a typical time, time horizon return inflation to target. Now, why, is, why are these things useful? So let me give you a practical working example of why these clarifications would be valuable. So if you have these, these um, clarifications, symmetry and a uh, two-year time horizon, it would mean that it would be inappropriate for the FOMC to reduce its level of accommodation if its inflation outlook was ever such that inflation would be below 2% over the following two years. So if you're, the reason I say that is if you're going to tighten policy when your inflation outlook is below 2% over the next two years, then that means you're going to take even longer to get back to target. You're, no, you're not going to be living up to your two-year time horizon to get back to your 2% objective. So this, if you, it, it, this kind of thinking, this kind of conclusion about appropriate monetary policy sheds light on an ongoing public, public conversation which is going on about whether the FOMC should begin targeting a higher range for the federal funds rate, that is uh, reducing the level of stimulus being provided by interest rates, sometime in 2015, sometime in the coming calendar year. Now, if you look at this graph that's before you, um, inflation tends to be high, uh, has been below target for a long time. And inflation tends to be highly persistent. So this long stay we see below target suggests to me that it's going to take some time for inflation to get back to 2%. So my, my benchmark outlook is that inflation will not get back to 2% until 2018, so four years from now. That means that 
Um, at any FOMC meeting held during 2015, in the coming year, inflation would be expected to be below 2% over the following two years. It'd be inappropriate for the FOMC to raise the target range for the Fed funds rate at any such meeting in 2015. Because again, to go back to my uh, argument, if you see inflation being below target over the next two, uh, two years, reducing accommodation takes you even further away from your, your objective. Now, there's uncertainty about the evolution of the, infl uh, the, of the inflation outlook. And this conclusion that I've reached about the timing of liftoff, that 2015 would not be the right time, is necessarily data dependent. The language changes in the framework statement that I've suggested would never tell the public exactly when interest rates are going to go up but they would have a, allow the public to have a better understanding of what conditions would engender that first interest rate increase. So let me wrap up and we can get to questions. Um, you know, most of the conversation here about monetary policy in this country concern what the FOMC is doing, how many assets we're buying, what the level interest rates are. I think these are, you know, these are certainly important questions and I, I don't want to say they're not. Um, but I, I think we really have to talk more but about a question which I think is more important than that, than, than what we're doing, and that is how the FOMC is doing. How are we doing in terms of meeting the objectives that Congress has set forth for us in terms of prices and employment? So I hope that my remarks today about the FOMC's goals and its communication about those goals will be helpful in steering the conversation in this, in this direction. Thank you very much for listening. I, I look forward to taking questions.